his kid destroyed on the season premiere of Knight Rider? Meet the lion. It's enormous. It's the biggest, baddest truck in the world. And it wants to turn Kit into a compact car. That brute. Can Michael survive the ultimate heavy metal showdown? That's a real good question. Find out on the special two-hour season premiere of Knight Rider. Be there. Welcome back, all you living, breathing insults to my existence. Wow, did I just start this intro with an insult? No, no, I'm only joking. I definitely value each and every one of you guys. I truly do. Well, unless Garth Knight is a subscriber watching from his African prison. Speaking of Garth, do you realize that throughout the course of the series, we meet the entire Knight family? I mean, think about it. Wilton Knight was married to Elizabeth. They had two children, that we know of anyways, Garth and Jennifer. Neat, isn't it? Makes you wonder if there's a third child out there, just waiting to cause trouble in a future reboot. You know, like Garth's little brother Wayne. Today we're going to dig into the second season premiere, and a fan favorite episode, Goliath. If you're new to our Not A Director's Cut episodes, we're going through the entire series, in order, and pointing out things you might have missed behind the scenes stories, filming locations, and more. We have the entire first season available on our channel, so go back and check those ones out. We guarantee you'll learn something. Whether you are watching from Las Vegas, Nevada, hi Rita Wilcox slash Lonnie, or the diamond mines in Africa, what's up Sambe Kuna? Welcome to our analysis of Goliath. And never forget, in the end, you'll lose. In the end, you're gonna be mine. Wow, did I just end this intro with a threat? Be sure to check out our exclusive merch not found anywhere else, like our semi-restoration team apparel, along with our line of Garthware, trademark pending, coffee mugs, t-shirts, and hoodies in a variety of colors to suit every taste. Your purchase directly supports this channel and helps us to continue bringing you awesome content. View the merch below or click the link in the description for our entire catalog. The original NBC airing of this episode featured a special teaser not found on subsequent releases. Check it out. There's excitement every night on NBC. For life in the fast lane, be there. You can NBC there, be there. And now, there's double trouble for Michael and Kit on the special two-hour season premiere of Knight Rider. Here we go! Out of the shadows of hatred comes a madman bent on revenge. The guy looks just like me. Michael must face his evil twin in a duel to the death because the highways aren't big enough for both of them. Mark my words, Michael Knight will die. His weapon is the supersonic truck of the future, programmed to destroy. You see what I see? Meet the lion. It's enormous. Michael, the vehicle in question is armored with my protective shell. It's the biggest, baddest truck in the world, and it wants to turn Kit into a combat car. That brute. That miserable, mechanical masher. Goliath is the key to a deadly plot to rule the world, and only Michael can stop it. Surely you're not planning to go nose to nose with that behemoth. Who will survive the ultimate heavy metal showdown? That's a real good question. Hold on for the two-hour season premiere of Knight Rider. Production 57823, Goliath. This episode was written by Robert Foster and Robert W. Gilmer and directed by Winrich Colby. It originally aired on NBC October 2nd, 1983. It was filmed August 8th through the 25th of 1983. It had the working title of Mirror Image, which is also the title of the novelization of this episode. It was the 22nd episode to air, but the 27th to be produced. Knight Rider actually filmed five other episodes for season two before they filmed Goliath. 
Return to Cadiz, Ring of Fire, Merchants of Death, Big Iron, and Brothers Keeper were all filmed before Goliath. They filmed those five episodes, and then they took a five and a half week break before they started on Goliath. The synopsis reads as follows. Michael returns to Las Vegas to investigate the disappearance of a blackjack dealer's brother, but he is shocked to find out that the man responsible is a member of the Knight family. All right, let's dig into the season two premiere. We'll start by backing up a little bit and going to the opening credits. Many of you have probably never noticed this, but this opening scene where Kid is racing towards you in the desert is actually a different take from the one you see in season one. You can tell that because the clouds are in a different location and the lighting is a bit different. But if you look at the desert floor, especially on this Blu-ray, you can see the tracks from their previous takes here. So this is actually different. This is the scene that would continue for seasons two, three, and four in the opening intro. So season one is unique, but this is actually a different take of Kit racing towards us in the desert. And this also marks the premiere of the title sequence being below Kit. In season one, we had it up here in the clouds. In season two, it's now below Kit and where it would stay for the rest of the series. We also get this great shot of the insert dash, which is, for those of you who don't know, the insert dash is the one that was never in a car, it was actually sitting on a soundstage. So they, they filmed this scene specifically for the opening intro. And if you look up here, you see just kind of a void of nothingness. You can tell that there's no car in, that this isn't in a car. If it was, there would be a, you know, the A pillar of the car here and you would see the window. But this was just filmed. They, they hung a sheet back here to kind of block off everything in the background. But this would have been filmed um, at the studio in, in one of their stages. The beginning montage uh, includes this scene where a mysterious man, who we'll learn is Garth Knight in a few minutes, is pulling up to a warehouse in the middle of the desert. This warehouse actually is Certaintied Gypsum. They, they are a drywall manufacturer, and they are still there today in Blue Diamond, Nevada. And in fact, if you look, all of the interior scenes here, there's stacks of drywall everywhere, and that's why. They were filming inside a drywall factory. So maybe, you know, Garth Knight's front for his illegal operations is a drywall factory. I don't know. But um, yeah, you can see stacks and stacks of drywall. And you see them every time they show scenes in this warehouse. Just look in the background and you'll see all this drywall. Ron Wilcox, who we just saw in the previous scene, who was about to uh, meet his demise, was taking some top secret pictures. And um, one of those pictures is what you see here of these two commandos um, loading some, you know, some crates and some other things. What you may not have realized is this is actually a scene that happens much, much later in the episode when the commandos are installing the rocket tubes on Goliath. And if you look in the background, you can see those rocket tubes right here. So all they did was they, they took this scene that happens much later in the episode, they inserted it here so the, the viewer could see that Ron was, you know, taking a picture of something. But um, he, in, in reality, he's taking a picture of the future. And we get our first look out of the shadows of Garth Knight. Um, and uh, with his, his cane that shoots, which we'll see again in Goliath Returns. Uh, David Hasselhoff always likes to tell the story of whenever his dad first saw this episode. And um, he called David and said that uh, the guy who played Garth is a better actor than he is. <laughs> and, you know, I, I, you know, maybe I agree. I don't know. But Garth was certainly over the top. And um, you'll see throughout this episode, we've we've highlighted some of our favorite faces of his, and this, of course, is definitely one of them. And we get our first scene of Michael in the new season, playing um, blackjack with Kit. The the cars. So, uh, as you re recall, in our season one uh, series of not a drop, not a drop to drink, <laughs> of not a director's cut, 
um, you know, we would highlight any time there were new Trans Ams that came on. And, uh, you know, they got a few more from the, the train derailment, which uh, if you're not familiar with the train derailment, check out our not a director's cut of the episode, The Final Verdict, and you'll learn all about it. But anyways, um, season two, we saw, we saw a couple train wreck cars kind of trickle in at the end of season one, but season two is where we really start to see them. And it's going to be a little confusing because, again, these episodes were filmed in a different order than they were aired. So we're watching Goliath, which is our, which is the uh, the sixth episode of season two to be filmed. So um, we're going to do our best to kind of break down the cars, um, even though the everything's out of order. It's going to make it a little bit more difficult. But the car you're looking at here was used in season one as the backup to the hero car. It now has a new role. It is now the dedicated insert car. When I say insert car, that is the car that is used primarily for interior shots whenever uh, David is driving. This is the car that they would connect to a camera truck and pull while um, they, you know, they had nine, uh, nine uh, stage lights and cameras mounted all on the outside and they would film the interiors. This is, um, if you remember from season one, the backup to the hero car, this is the car we currently own. Um, it's in the Peterson. And um, one easy, easy way to tell this car in season two um, and a little beyond is the chrome coat hooks right here. This is the only car that did not have the factory tan coat hooks, but it had aftermarket chrome uh, coat hooks on it. You'll see that quite a bit in season two. Um, but this was the primary role for this car, almost exclusively for season two. It did have a little bit of other roles, which we'll get into later, but you can see that the Michael Chaffee console um, is gone. Now, remember, the Michael Chaffee console was never in this car to begin with. It's actually in the hero car but this is the debut of the more sleek more more streamlined uh, console that universal studios built because the chaffee style one was just too it, it obstructed the view too much it hung down too low for the cameras and for the people driving the cars so they came up with this this new version we can see in this insert car for a good portion of the first uh half of the second season that it's just a blank uh, plug. There's no buttons, there's no lights, there's nothing. And uh, that'll change. They're going to give uh, do, do a little refresh on some of the cars here uh, in a few episodes where you'll see some of those details come out. But for now, it's just a blank plug, and we can see that it's got the uh, cap on it, the, the debut of the cap to kind of finish it off and give it a nice, a nice uh, complete finish there. And I always like this, Devin is calling, so what's Michael do? He's pressing pretend buttons. And what's funny is buttons wouldn't even be located here anyways. The buttons are supposed to be along this panel. This was always supposed to be blank, but he's just pressing buttons and you hear tone sounds. And somehow Devin makes his way through despite Michael not knowing what he's doing. And here's the debut of uh, Rebecca Holden, who played uh, April Curtis in the second season. Uh, again, in reality, she had already filmed five other episodes before this, but uh, this is the first time the viewers get introduced to her. And uh, it's really kind of a non-event. They don't make a big deal about her you know, joining the team. They just act like she's always been there. But um, Rebecca was brought in, obviously, because uh, Patricia McPherson left the series, um, reportedly due to uh, conflicts with uh, executive producer Robert Foster. So... Um, April was uh, brought in for the second season, and um, of course, as you know, she'll only be around this season, and then she's uh, replaced once again by Patricia McPherson. For the start of season two, NBC once again promoted a mail-in offer, similar to the Competition is No Competition campaign from the summer of 1982, before Knight Rider premiered. This time, fans of the show could receive the Kit Kit, a foldable schematic sheet of Kit, a nice tie-in with the emergency schematic blueprint seen in Goliath. A commercial featuring David Hasselhoff touted the Kit Kit, with David giving viewers the information needed to obtain a copy. Here's the original commercial, which aired in the weeks prior to Goliath. On Sunday, 
October 2nd, Kit and I face our greatest challenge in a spectacular two-hour movie. We're hoping we can win with the secrets found in this, Kit Kit. To get your free copy, send a self-addressed stamped envelope to Kit Kit, Box 80, Hollywood. Get your Kit Kit and be there. We have uh, Garth watching some of uh, Kit's greatest hits, no pun intended there. And, um, you know, it's always interesting, you, you know, to think that Garth had uh, operatives out there filming all of these scenes. Um, but I guess we're not supposed to think about that. So here we have a scene from Hearts of Stone. And then, once again, one of our favorite uh, looks of uh, Garth, his stare, his evil stare. Uh, and then we have a bunch of clips from Deadly Maneuvers, back to Garth again. And then we mentioned this back in our Chariot of Gold uh, episode commentary. This is actually a cut scene from Chariot of Gold. We never see Kit, a driverless Kit, crashing through the Helios gates. Um, we only see the remnants of that whenever Kit and Michael and Bonnie are escaping. But um, this is a cut scene from Chariot of Gold. Here's the uh, debut of Elizabeth Knight played by Barbara Rush. Barbara is an amazingly accomplished actress. She is in her 90s now, still alive, um, still doing well, but she had parts on just a million different, um, different productions dating all the way to the early 1950s. Here we have um, a nice little montage of uh, Kit pulling into Vegas and they play uh, the Rolling Stones Give Me Shelter and it's just a really really uh, cool few seconds whenever they're doing this but this is the debut of Kit's new look you could say um, you know gone are the days mostly where Kit uses the factory pop-up headlights and in uh, in exchange for that we now see him use nearly exclusively the fog lights um, that were added in the grill. We also see the debut of the sets of two fog lights on each side versus three. And this became something that actually got written into the official Knight Rider Writer's Bible that was given to all of the writers for the show that when all possible, Kit should be using his fog lights and not his pop-up headlights. So let's take a little sidebar here and let's look at this Knight Rider Writer's Bible because I think you'd find it interesting. So this this is dated April of 1984. And I'm going to scroll through it, but um you know, we'll um you can pause the video and and read some of this if you want. It's fascinating. There's a whole history of the background of the foundation and Wilton Knight and backgrounds on each one of the the cast members and of course Kit and the different equipment and functions he has. Um but if we keep scrolling down here, it's it's interesting. You know, um, in answer to the question, how fat can, fast can Kit go? The answer is, how fast do you want it to go? Which I believe came from Chariot of Gold, didn't it? And look at this. We never film under the hood. Kit's programmed not to take a human life. Um, you know, when Michael um, wants to communicate, Michael must press buttons on the roof to patch them through. So there were some set guidelines that, that the show had to... To do to be able to um, you know make it work and make it consistent and you know here they talk about the com link what the permanent sets are and if we keep scrolling down we've got a bio on Michael Knight and and um, you know a checklist for the writers of what each episode must uh, include a little bit on, on Michael Knight what you can and can't do uh, same with Kit and if we scroll down somewhere in here we're kind of looking at this together uh, a mix here of of how the the season should look you know promotable episodes sweep shows um a personal michael story a devon story things like that um right here so this this one is very fascinating look it's dated september 15th 1983 which was right at the start of season two about um two weeks before goliath premiered and here we can see we never see your film under the hood, but the hood can be open while April works um, off screen on the off screen engine. Uh, the scanner light should always be on when Kitten is in motion. As you probably noticed in season one, there was a lot of scenes where Kit's scanner was not on. And starting in season two, that would change. You know, even when Kit's just sitting there, the scanner more likely than not is uh, is on. Um, 
the interior dashboard lights should be on at all times, including when the car is parked and engine is off. They want to show off the car. Kit should always be clean and shiny. Um, Michael should be consistent with pushing buttons, which have already been established. Well, we know that one was never followed. Um, caution should be used when photographing the blind driver. We should not see the bulk behind the seat. Not too successful there. Um, here, this is what I was talking about. When filming kit at night, use only four halogen lights, two on each side of the car, along with the scanner. It is preferable not to use the normal headlights. So there you go. And uh, some information on the semi, um, a little bit more general information on the show, and then a whole list of kit's capabilities. Again, this was all for the writers to um, help them whenever they're writing the scripts to be consistent with the show. So there was a little bonus nugget for you. I wasn't even planning on showing that, but it kind of worked out with this scene. So that's why, you know, we're starting to see more of kit always scanner on and fog lights instead of the headlights. It was mandated in the writer's Bible. And you can tell that 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 guidance, this was kind of a tra transitional time for that guidance because we see uh, then see Kit's scanner turn off and the headlights are opened up. And I think this might be the only time in the entire series we see two fog lights with the headlights on. In season one, we saw all three fog lights with the headlights, but this is the first time we see two fog lights with um, the headlight. And, th and then it transitions again, and now we've got headlights and the three fog lights again. So there you go. Michael Knight from Knight Rider is one of my biggest roles and one of my most popular. The show, the look, the car was also iconic. Now, one of the most watched episodes was Goliath, featuring Garth Knight, Michael Knight's evil nemesis. It was one of my dad's favorites. You know, I remember when he watched it, he said, Garth is a much better actor than you are. That's my dad. Go figure. Tonight, I'm going to have an act off, or as I like to call it, a face off, with none other than Garth himself, who I tracked down doing hypnotism and dinner theater in Lofton, Nevada. Garth, come on out. Michael Knight is a living, breathing insult to my existence. Can you believe that line? That was an actual line from the show. Face off begins. Garth Knight is a living, breathing insult to my existence. Nice shirt. You've got your catchphrase, and I've got mine. Don't barf on the Garth. <laughs> I'm trying it out. What do you think? Want one? Sure. Ten bucks. But for you, it's twenty. Still being Garth Knight, 30 years later. Go away. I'll be over at catering if you change your mind. Is that a cheese Danish I smell? <laughs> I still can't believe my dad thought he was a better actor. I'm crushed. And making her return appearance um, from the original pilot is Sean Southwick, here playing Rita Wilcox. She played Lonnie in the pilot. Um, we had the chance to talk with Sean back in 2018, and um, she shared some, some uh, really cool stories, both about the pilot and about um, her filming of Goliath. So as we go through the rest of our commentary, we're going to pepper in some of the neat stories that she told, so stay tuned for that. Here's one of our first good looks in the episode at Goliath, which in reality I believe is a 1973 Peterbilt pacemaker, Peterbilt 352, I believe. Um, so many people have asked us, do you know where this truck is today? Uh, mainly because of our other videos on restoring the flag semi that we found. We do not have any solid leads on what happened to this truck. My guess is, after Goliath returns, it was stripped of all of its Goliath accessories, the grill, you know, the rocket tubes, all that stuff. And it was probably used in other productions. It might have even been used later in Knight Rider in some, with some of the other Peterbilts we see. But um, 
as of right now, we have zero leads on Goliath and where it is. So if you know, reach out to us. We'd love to talk to you. Here's the scene. Michael's returning to Caesar's palace. I know it's kind of blurry and hard to see, but right here we have Kit driving through a large puddle. And I point this out for a very specific reason. There had been a story, kind of a rumor for a long time, that um, it rained heavily during the filming of Goliath, so heavily that it flooded the basement of Caesar's palace. And the basement parking garage happens to have been where all the Knight Rider cars, the Mercedes, and all those were stored. Um, we asked Sean Southwick about this in 2018 when we talked to her, and she absolutely confirmed that yes, that is true. She didn't see it for a fact, but she remembers at the time of filming that um, the crew was talking about how it had rained in Las Vegas unusually hard. It flooded the, the parking garage of Caesars, and um, it it flooded the cars, some of the cars. I don't know to what extent, she didn't know to what extent, but it was bad enough that they had to rearrange the shooting schedule while they were able to get the cars out and get them cleaned up and ready to film once again. So um, this short scene where you see Kit driving through a puddle, um, there's actually an entire story behind that. We get this nice establishing shot of uh, the foundation and you know, up until this point in the series, they had only filmed one episode at Arden Villa, which is where this was uh, located at in Pasadena, and that was White Bird. So this establishing shot that you see here actually came from the filming of Brothers Keeper, which, again, it was one of the episodes filmed before Goliath. So whenever they were filming at this mansion for Brothers Keeper, they also filmed some establishing shots like you see here. Uh, they would go on to use the actual mansion in just a couple other episodes, um, A Knight in Shining Armor and Goliath Returns. And then every other time you see it, it's actually stock footage from the filming of, of one of these four episodes. Something else neat to point out, in this scene where um, you know Devin is demanding answers regarding Garth and who he is, and there's also this one mentioned by April of Kit's protective coating. We've known all throughout season one that Kit had an indestructible alloy, is what they called it in season one, but this is the first time it's actually given a name, which is the molecular, <laughs> molecular bonded shell. Um, and this will be the name that they use going forward, but this is actually the first time in the entire series we hear the name of that alloy. And speaking of the alloy, here they're applying it to Goliath, but in the background, you'll see in this drywall warehouse, there's also a ton of these props from the company Modern Props, which rented out all these sci-fi looking things. So this one back here, we'll see a couple other times in this episode, but we also see it in other episodes of Knight Rider. I believe we see it in Night of the Juggernaut, but this is a rental piece, a sci-fi rental piece from Modern Props, which um, they're now, as of I think last year, they're now uh, closed and out of business. Michael and Devin and April are pulling up uh, to the jet at uh, the airport. Uh, just one little thing to note, which is kind of neat. Uh, the license plate on this uh, Cadillac actually says, it looks like flag 11, maybe? There's two digits there, it's hard to see. But this is one of the first appearances of the white California license plate in the entire series. Up until this point, anytime we saw a California plate, it was blue with the yellow letters, just like the night license plate. And really, um, a lot of the plates we're still going to see in season two are still the blue color. But this is the first appearance of the the uh, white, you know, second half of the 80s style California plate. So here's a good look at the upgraded front end for the hero car. So from season one to season two, they used the same hero car. They, they upgraded uh, the front nose, though, because if you remember in season one, we had plexiglass turn signal blackouts. Now all of the cars have these um, molded in indents. So we have, we have two original bumpers with this style. One of them has these indents actually molded and indented into the fiberglass. The other one... Um, just has a groove right here, if that makes sense. So there are a couple different styles, but um, these were switched out from the plexiglass covers because they had such a hard time keeping the plexiglass 
uh, to lay flat when the car was driving. Wind would get under it and it would start uh, bowing or fall off completely. So for season two and season three, they switched over to this uh, molded in look. So from a glance, it looks like those covers are still there, but in reality, they're not. We also still see that the Hero Car has its fog light grills. They're kind of hard to see. These grills would be going away uh, in the second half of the second season. And then we really, um, with a small exception, we really wouldn't see these again. There is one car that had them well into season three. But for the most part, the grills were um, removed just so the fog lights could show a little bit better. Back in the drywall factory, just a few more examples of modern props. Um, you know, there's this uh, this piece that we talked about earlier, but then we also have this console and this console over here, both of which um, will be seen in Knight Rider again. Um, this console, I'm pretty sure, is in The Wrong Crowd and Night Sting. Uh, I think we see this console in The Scent of Roses, perhaps. Um, but yeah, all this stuff will reappear again. And here's the scene that I was talking about way back at the beginning. So when, when uh, Ron Wilcox was doing his surveillance, he broke into the, the uh, warehouse and took some photos. Um, he was actually taking photos at this point in the episode when they're actually loading the rocket tubes and installing them on Goliath. So there you go. And of course, I couldn't pass this up without at least making a mention of it. Probably one of the best lines or most memorable lines, maybe in the entire series, Michael Knight is a living, breathing insult to my existence. Um, so let me know what you think in the comments below. Is this, you know, one of the iconic lines from the show? Or is this a line you don't even think about that's throwaway? Let me know. I'm curious. Season two also introduces us to a new um, episode commercial transition screen I guess you could call it so in season one if you remember the you know whenever they were about to go to commercial they would freeze frame and then the picture would just kind of slide down into the bottom right corner with a still of kit you know a still a still shot of, of kit driving by but starting in season two they moved to this transition where um, you know the the picture uh, zooms out or zooms back into you know nothing and then we see uh, a scene we see usually we see kit driving towards us in the desert but for goliath only we see this very special transition where it's the scenes closing and then it ends and it freeze frames right here you know to um the uh the upcoming confrontation between goliath and kit but um, starting in the next episode and really throughout the rest of the series, it's the standard transition of Kit in the desert driving, you know, at you in the, with the camera. So, but this is the first time we see this transition in the series. So now we're at uh, Chief's previously owned vehicles. And this is Ivan Naranjo. I'm sure I pronounced that wrong. But um, he returns in Burial Ground. This is his first appearance here. So Chief uh, instructs Michael to go straight out I-15, and uh, then it cuts to this beautiful, beautiful shot um, with Kit coming up to Red Bluff. So in reality, Red Bluff is actually the Valley of Fire State Park in Overton, Nevada. Um, this, what you're looking at here, is called Elephant Rock. Um, this this uh, rock configuration is still there today. I was out in that area a number of years ago and I made a detour and I climbed all the way up. You know, you can see down here the parking lot. We parked down here, climbed all the way up here and I took this exact same shot. And let me tell you, if you're ever in Nevada, you need to stop and uh, do this. Stop out here, climb all the way up here and just stop. You will hear wonderful, wonderful silence because there's nothing for miles around. It's magnificent. So this is Valley of Fire State Park, Elephant Rock. So let me zoom in, and we have uh, Kit pulling up to a stop. This is the hardtop stunt car, the one that was introduced last season. So it's still going strong here. For this episode, they used uh, five different cars. We had, obviously, this one, the hardtop stunt car. We had um, the hero car. We had the insert car, which we already discussed. And we had the fairly new at this time, because again, these were filmed out of order, left-hand blind drive car, which we'll discuss whenever we get to that part in the episode. And then the fifth car was the uh, destroyed car coming up that uh, we'll talk about. 
hard to see here, but this is the hero car. And we can see that the hero car also has had the Michael Chaffee style console replaced with, you know, the newer style that was used for the rest of the series, but no buttons in it yet, just kind of a plug. And I shouldn't say no buttons, there are a few side buttons here, which you can just barely make out. But one other enhancement they made to the dash of this car between Season 1 and Season 2 is they added in... Um, the uh, the correct voice box so we can see here just barely that we've got the equalizer style voice box instead of the uh, the the square one that we saw in season one early season one um, and I should point out that this change is here in Goliath it wasn't it wasn't made between season one and season two it was made a few episodes into season two but we'll get into that whenever we get to the other episodes that were filmed before Goliath. I know it's confusing. I probably should have done these in production order, not aired order, but we're too late for that. And we have this wonderful scene, which became iconic because it ended up being used in the intro for seasons two through four. Uh, this is Devin leaving the airport in Goliath, and um, you, I'm sure you'll recognize this from the, the opening intro. By the way, I forgot to mention this at the beginning, but Goliath beat out the pilot as the highest rated all new episode of the entire series 26 million people watched this um back when it was on now if you equate that to something today you know obviously there were less networks back then but 26 million people i mean that was more than some of the top rated shows of the last few years ever got in rating so um, it was definitely a big hit but also you know there was less to choose from back then for sure Here's our first appearance in the episode of the inside of the semi. Now, um, between seasons one and two, they you know did an upgrade on the interior. Season one, the semi was much more industrial looking, um, with you know uh, uh, metal racks and boxes for parts of kit and everything. They redid it for season two to kind of give it a more um, homey comfortable look so they got rid of the you know all of the the grays and the and brought in these warm brown colors and carpeted it and put in this this wood wall unit and different things like that this look would would remain for the rest of the series we also see the introduction of the the drop down uh, analyzer right here and as well as this uh, stand-up analyzer both of these would remain with the uh the show until the end of the, the series. These both also came from modern props, but these two were on long-term rentals. So Michael's heading back to Red Bluff. Um, I pause it here because this is again the hardtop stunt car that we saw earlier, but I wanted, this is, this is a good look kind of at the inside of it. So we can see it has a completely stock dash still. Um, it's got the stock Trans Am gauges, and instead of the round steering wheel, they just put a gull wing in. But other than that, the interior is pretty much you know, as as it came from the factory. And then we move forward a screen and we get this great shot of the interior. We can see from the roof the fake T-top strips that they added to make it look like T-tops uh, during drive-bys. And then we can also see that this is clearly a hardtop car. Um, we see the tan here, but there's no tan headliner. There's, they took the headliner out and it's just the, the black underneath of the shell of the roof. And... Um, yeah, this is again. This is one of the train wreck cars, and for those for you Trans Am aficionados, you'll recognize this um, roof seatbelt trim piece. And this style of trim piece um, was only in 1983 and up. 1982 did not have this tailpiece down here that tucked behind the speaker cover. It was just a square piece up here. So, um, but we know that all of the train wreck cars were 1983 models, so we would expect to see this trim piece. So, there you go. Here's one of our first looks at a Jack Sesum's model uh, model kit. So beginning in this episode and used extensively in season two, uh, less so in season three and four, but still used. Um, Jack Sesum's of Sesum's and Slagle Productions came in and did miniature versions of of kit and and you know background scenes and things like that to um, help cut down the the costs the of uh, doing the stunts with the actual cars and helping to preserve the cars a little bit. So this is the first scene of uh, the model scene of Kit in this episode, and we're going to see a number of those here coming up, and I'll point them out. Also, if you're interested in learning more about Sesums and Slagle, check out our previous video. We did um, a, uh, a miniature Kit uh, video, an introduction to them, where we actually had one of these screen-used cars with us, and we 
take a closer look at it and give you a little bit of the history. So the duel between Goliath and Kit has started, and once again, these are both models. Um, and you can kind of tell that when you freeze frame that these aren't the actual vehicles. And then whenever Kit gets hit, you know, he falls on his side, and again, clearly a model. We can see there's no Trans Am hood bulge here, and um, you know, it just looks different from the actual car that they banged up, which we'll see here uh, in a minute after the commercial break. It should also be pointed out that it appears, based on our research, that Sesams and Slagle had two different kit bodies. So whenever they first premiered in season two, the the kit cars looked less like a trans. They looked more model like. They the the uh, um, carving in them uh, was a little bit more crude. So you can see here on this one, there's no opening for the scanner. And, um, you know, there's lines here that just kind of fade off and, and everything. So starting in, we think it's about season three, they redid the body of the, the models to make them look more like um, an actual, uh, more like a, the actual kit, the full-size car versus kind of a model. So what you're seeing here is a very early kind of first generation design that Sesams and Slagle came up with. We return after Kit's destruction, and this is the first thing we see. It is supposedly a piece of Kit wedged in the desert floor. In reality, this is a stock 82 through 84 Trans Am front ground effect piece, which ironically, Kit didn't have. He did in the original pilot, but then they ended up removing it. So, and now we move into this fantastic uh, sequence where Kit is uh, disabled on his side in the middle of the desert and Michael must try and figure out a way to get him out. So this is a car that uh, we haven't seen before. It is a train wreck car and um, again because they were filmed in the order they were filmed this car this isn't the first time the car was used but it's the first time we see the car and believe it or not despite all of its damage it's not the last time we will see this car in the series. So um, we're going to go through the sequence here and point out some of the little details about this car. So we'll move in. Um, we get a great look here. You can see that the passenger side is all shredded up. I mean, the door all the way back, there's some damage on the rear quarter here. Um, and incidentally, this damage on the rear quarter is going to be very important coming up. I'll tell you why. Um, so we've got the shredded door, shredded fender. We've got... Um, We've got a T-top car with the stock dashboard in place. And moving forward, we can see this car has rear defrost, which most of the Knight Rider cars do not have. And Michael's just hanging out there. There's another look here. You can see the rear defrost lines right there. He gets ready to pull the, the uh, T-top off. We can see this was originally a red car. If you look right here, you can see red in the door. He removes the T-top. We can see 82 to 83 style hooked T-tops. Again, we know this is an 83 because it's a train wreck car. And we can see it does not have tan interior. This is actually the um, the light uh, sand interior, I believe. But it's not. It's too light to be the, the factory tan interior. And we've got um, a windshield that is not clear. This is actually the factory windshield with the tint across the top. For pretty much all of the Night Rider cars, they removed the factory windshields and put one that was all clear so it wouldn't obstruct the view inside. Um, we can also see we've got the uh, sun visor here pulled down. And Michael reaches under the dash to pull out the emergency schematic blueprint. The Not the one and only time in the series we see it if you're um, looking close enough. So this is supposedly a schematic book that uh, tells Michael how to repair kit and stored under his dash. We actually see a small glimpse of this book in the series finale, Voodoo Night, laying on the table in the semi. And then we move uh, to the outside a little bit later on. We can see uh, Kit's hood is open. Um, we see right here, this is a Crossfire fuel injection air cleaner. And uh, whether this car had that or not, we don't know. We're assuming it might have, but it could have just been a part that he pulled off of this car that wasn't part of this car. And we can also see um, that they've covered the bottom of Kit with this um, with a piece of sheet metal or plastic. And this would be the first time that they try and start hiding Kit's undercarriage. But, you know, a lot of times in season one, when Kit is 
uh, skiing, we can see the undercarriage of the car and it looks suspiciously like a Trans Am. But starting in season two and really for the rest of the series, they start to try and hide the undercarriage to kind of keep the mystery of Kit intact. So as Michael gets up, we can see here, um, I always thought this was neat. So this bend in the hood, you can see here where the, the production cut the bracing underneath the Trans Am hood right here and here and here so that they could put a crease in the hood right there. Um, normally, you know, if those pieces were in, it would be much, much harder to bend that, but they just literally took a saw, cut all of this out to make it so they could bend the hood. And here's a better look. Here's Michael pulling off the base of the Crossfire air cleaner from the engine. So chances are this was a red Trans Am with the sand, light sand interior with the Crossfire fuel injection. And as Michael gets in, we can see that there's no overhead console. We just have the factory dome light missing the lens cover, but there's the factory dome light. And then after Kit is righted and uh, starts going off through the desert, we just get this really cool Mad Max style um, looking Kit driving through the desert. And you can see the side is just shredded like a, like a giant mechanical bear took his claws and just ripped down the side of Kit. Yeah, so you can get a better look. And then Kit drives past the burrow um, and the, uh, the miner, I guess. And one interesting to note, Jack Gill talked about this scene. Um, they had to tack down the burrow's front feet. And if you watch this scene, you'll see his rear feet move, but the burrow's front feet stay still. And that's because Jack was driving so fast through the desert, he was worried that the burrow would move and um, get hit by the car. So in reality, what happened is Kit flew past him and all of a sudden Jack heard a loud bang and the windshield was cracked and there was um, blood or guts on the windshield, not to be graphic, but it turns out he hit a giant bird right about the time he passed this burrow. And he was so worried that he hit the burrow or the miner, but in reality it was, it was just a bird. But um, that's why they have the burrow's feet tacked down to the desert floor, just to kind of keep it safe and protected here. But you can see as we go through, the door's just shredded. There's, looks like a tumbleweed in the side. Um, yeah, there we go. And another good look here at the car. That's probably the best view we get of it, of the damage right there with the hood buckled and the, the side all destroyed. And then one of our favorite uh, quotes, uh, where on earth are you going, Michael? And he says, out of the desert. Um, it's actually a little in-joke that AJ and I have, but that's for another day. So what's neat about this is you can see a previous take. You can see the tracks over here on the left from the previous take um, that they did. And there's another set of tracks going this way. So here's another one of our favorite Garth faces, and this seems like a good opportunity to pause and talk about the script's description of Garth. So the description of the first time that the viewer see Garth is this, standing 10 feet away, facing him, meaning Ron Wilcox, is the man from the limousine. He is tall and lean, wears a tuxedo, and carries a black diamond studded cane. He also wears a discreet diamond stud in his left ear. He moves with the grace of a panther, but also with a slight limp, the reason for which will be forthcoming. Except for minor cosmetic differences, the man is a dead ringer for Michael Knight. The reason isn't coincidental. He is late, the late Wilton Knight's only son, Garth. And then later on, Michael asks Rita about Garth, and Rita replies, his name is Garth with an E. He's very particular about the E. So... Um, that kind of gives kind of an interesting backstory. The limp obviously never made it into the episode, but uh, everything else did, including the diamond studded ear. The script also mentions a little bit of his backstory of how he got his wealth. Devin and April are talking to a, uh, an African government official, and um, they say Garth Knight entered Africa in October of 1977. He bought up rights and options to a vast quantity of diamond mines, which had been declared inoperable for reasons of safety. He then proceeded to hire slave labor from a neighboring country to work the mines. Less than a month after commencing work, one of the mines collapsed and buried 49 men alive. None survived. 
So that kind of gives you a little bit of the backstory of Sombe Kuna and um, you know the, the references in the episode to Diamond Mines and also explains how he got his wealth because he didn't get it from Wilton Knight. So here, Kit's being repaired in the semi. We've got a technician in his Knight Industries uh, coveralls. And uh, this gun is another modern props piece. This gun was actually auctioned off a few years ago and uh, is now in the hands of a Knight Rider fan, I believe. So here we get a good look at the, uh, the logo on the back. And we can see it's just a hastily patched on uh, piece of artwork to the back of the coveralls. Kit receives his laser in this episode, which um, would again come into play in, in uh, another episode in Kit vs. Car. But uh, we get a nice close-up here when April presses the button. We can see that some of the dry rub letters have, uh, have already uh, come off. We'll see this laser button again towards the end of the episode when Michael presses it, and the letters are intact. So I'm not sure. They must have redone it for later in the episode. Another Garth face. So this is in the uh, in Caesar's Palace when Michael confronts Garth, and I have to point out just the ridiculousness of this uh, function of Kit. So you know, obviously you have to suspend uh, your belief whenever um, you know Kit's turbo boosting or driving by himself and all that stuff. But this is, is borderlines on magic, right? So so two physical dice are being rolled, and then Kit somehow can make the dice spark and change numbers. Uh, I always thought this was super ridiculous, but um, nevertheless, it's one of Kit's new features for season two, I suppose. Fortunately, we never see it again. Another Garth face. And here's the first time that we see supposedly Michael and Garth together in the same scene. Obviously, this is David Hasselhoff over here, and clearly you can tell that this is not David Hasselhoff. You can tell the hair's not as poofy on the side, so you can tell that that's certainly not him. And then, of course, we have uh, a nice split screen here between the two of them, with this border being the divider. So Michael gets in, tells Kit that uh, Garth took the bait. This is the insert car, and this is one of the rare times in Season 2 we see the exterior of the insert car, which in Season 1 was the backup to the hero car. I know, it's confusing, but you can again tell by that chrome um, coat hook on the side. And then we advance ahead, and um, we've got uh, Garth in the limo, actually Jack Gill, and then we've got um, Kit... Here, this is the hardtop stunt car that we uh, saw earlier in the episode. Interesting to note, this license plate, this Nevada 289GGG, believe it or not, we see this plate a second time. If you watch the episode Night Strike, the end of season three, there is a Jeep parked at the hotel where the episode takes place that has the same license plate. So now we kind of zoom in on Garth driving, but um, again, it's actually Jack Gill. And if you watch, he's actually talking in the walkie-talkie to whoever's in uh, Kit right now to, to coordinate the, the driving and the stunt. So right there, he's on his walkie-talkie. And by the way, this is not the same Mercedes used as Devin's Mercedes in Season 1. This is a maroon-colored one. Season 1 for Devin was uh, more of a bright red, so this is a different car. This whole sequence um, is only a few miles outside of Las Vegas. It's an absolutely beautiful drive. I went out here uh, last year and I found this exact location and I took some photos right where the semi was. And this is the scene where Garth will uh, escape the semi via the roof access on the trailer and jump into the Cadillac. But So when you see Garth escaping from the semi, the semi is driving down this way and Garth escapes. And in the Cadillac and drives off down that road. So in addition to um, the changes to the semi, we also finally get to see the uh, the break room or the coffee room in the back here. This is the first time. Prior to this, it was just kind of a black void that someone would walk into. But now when he opens the door, we actually come into this nice little area with a kitchen and um, a sofa bed, a phone, and some uh, storage areas right here. So we'll see this back room uh, off and on throughout the rest of the series. And now we move to um, Michael and Rita uh, driving the desert. Michael's pretending to be Garth to try and uh, plant a bomb on Goliath. Um, again, 
This is the hardtop stunt car. We get a great look here at the skid plate and the, the bar that they welded in to connect the skid plate to. And um, again, we can see the, just the same squared off overhead console it's had since season one. This is Jack Gill driving. He forgot his goatee. And this is a lady stunt driver, not uh, Sean Southwick. And Michael pulls up again. There's the hardtop and the fake T-top strips to make it look like a T-top. And Michael fails to uh, secure a bomb on Goliath. And once again, we've got Hasselhoff here and his uh, double here pretending to be Michael. And then we cut the scene. Now Michael's here pretending to be Garth, played by David. And the other guy, dressed as Michael, pretending to be Garth, not David. I know, it's confusing. And once again... After the commercial break here, once the, the, you can clearly see that this is not Hasselhoff. Obviously, he's right here, but still. All right, enough of that. So now we move Michaels inside the RV while Goliath gets ready to um, tackle Red Bluff. And uh, we're back at the Valley of Fire. Uh, and the whole climax, the whole Red Bluff sequence takes place at Valley of Fire. And if you weren't sure about that, just watch the TV. There's the entrance, Valley of Fire State Park. If you go there today, this sign, this exact sign is still there today, 35 years later. And then we move to this great shot of Goliath. Um, one thing to, to note about what uh, the script says about Goliath. So... Um, it says, it occupies half the warehouse space. It's so large. This is our first full daylight view of it, and it's a behemoth, a huge grizzly bear of a truck, all lacquered black and spotless chrome. It's four times the length of kit and two stories high. It weighs 14 tons. Uh, so once again, this is Valley of Fire. I went here a number of years ago. We've got a then and now shot of this exact location. I'll tell you, when I was standing here, it was eerily quiet, and you almost expected Goliath to just come around the bend. So here, some of the rockets are getting ready to shoot. They actually did work. They actually had these on air. They, they were valid. Um, they actually had this whole setup actually working to shoot these rockets. So um don't try and follow the continuity of these rockets because you see he shoots two he shoots a third one there goes another one more being shot out um you know and then you watch the explosions on the door there's many more explosions than there were rocket shot and then it goes back and all the rockets are back in place so again just 1980s editing that you weren't supposed to know notice and another thing you weren't supposed to notice is the fact that even though Michael's, uh, you know, being held prisoner and there's all these people always close around him, no one notices that he's talking on his watch. This is the premiere of the left-hand blind drive car. Now, again, we there were five episodes that were filmed prior to this, so this is not the first time that the production used this car, but this is the first time the viewers get to see it. And yes, that is Sean Southwick in the passenger seat, she um, told a funny story about this specific scene and she said Jack Gill was inside of the driver's seat and she said she really got to know him quite well during this time because she was sitting in, in this car a lot with Jack on, you know, behind the seat and they had a kind of a lot of downtime in between takes and filming and all that stuff. So she said she really got to know him and she was just so impressed with um, the, the work that he does on this show. Um, but you can see here, the, the left-hand blind drive car is always pretty easy to spot, especially in these early episodes. It's the only car, it's got the, the, the more sleek overhead console, but it's the only one that has the passenger side sun visor, which it will keep for quite a while. And of course, you can tell the seat, it still looks a little bulkier, but it looks more like a factory PMD seat than that seat suit we had in season one. So going forward for the rest of this season anytime you see kit driving by himself in season two it's this car in season three they get a right hand blind drive car but we'll get into that later and moving forward we're still with the left hand blind drive car but now it has the rubber shell on top of it because apparently running into this post would cause a lot of damage to the car which is interesting because they're going to hit the post with the front nose which is not protected but whatever um, left hand blind drive car is also one of the few cars to have the uh, uh, camera tow bar underneath of it and then uh, michael is saved and they go out into the desert and if you look closely you can see the tracks right here from when uh, damaged kit and michael were heading out of the desert they're right there 
And another magical uh, feature of Kit where he can just, you know, have these handcuffs placed there and suddenly he can unlock them with magic. I don't know. Ding. Ding. Whatever. So we're back inside the insert car. We can see that the driver's seat does not have the PMD emblem across the uh, backrest right here where it should. So this was probably reupholstered and they forgot to add that in. And here's what I was mentioning. Here's the other laser button that looks a little cleaner. Goliath is uh, lost, has lost his trailer. And this is a model. This is a Jack Sessoms model. But you can see that the trailer has fallen off here. And then immediately the next scene, the trailer is still connected. But um, just another editing mistake. But here, here's what I was talking about. Here is the original shell for the model. And you can tell how this just doesn't look like a Trans Am, right? It's, it's, there's not much detail on this. And like I said, they're going to change this whole car around. And the wheels also, look at those wheels. They'll change this, the wheels and the, and the shell of it later on in the series. But this is the original design for that. Goliath, on the other hand, they did a very convincing job. This is the model, but um, it sure looks like, uh, like the real Peterbilt truck. And then uh, there's a nice fight at the end here. This is the hardtop stunt car, uh, Hasselhoff's double, and Rita gets out. We can see we're missing uh, the passenger armrest, but whatever. And you can also get a look here at the trunk pull release right there. And this great scene, if you freeze frame this, you can actually get a look at this not Hasselhoff stunt guy right here, whoever he is. And now, while we listen to Joe's selection of Knight Rider music that we received directly from Don Peak himself, we'd like to thank these Patreon supporters. We are featuring these fine supporters at our Knight Rider prop restorer level. Thank you very much for your support. And for those of you at the Knight Rider history hunter level, we're recognizing you right now in the description. Now, if you enjoyed seeing this golden nugget of Knight Rider history being rescued from obscurity, then please consider supporting us on Patreon. Your support would empower us to bring you even more of these historical nuggets. We are the Knight Rider Historians. Till next time, take care, everybody. Bye-bye.